Hello there everybody and welcome to a new video for Age of Wonders 4. In this one I want to introduce to you a chaos build for the industrious culture that is really really powerful in all stages of the game. I have successfully beaten the game on hard difficulty with it. I have successfully won a war against barbarian culture settling right next to me. This is the aftermath of that. And I really must say these, this is a pretty solid build, which has a few weaknesses, of course, but, uh, well, I'm going to go over each and everything in this uh, video. We're going to go over the tomes, over the culture, the strategy that I use, and all the juicy parts in between. So, let's get started with this culture and racial thing. So, I went with a species that uses mounts. Here I went for nightmare mounts, but actually I wouldn't recommend them that much. I think wolves and spiders or unicorns are all better alternatives. I wanted to try them out because we're actually using a morale strategy in this build, but in all honesty, I feel like this is a very, very underpowered trade. Use something else if you want to min-max a little bit harder. In the mental trade, I use the retaliation upgrade ferocious because you know with the industrious folks you go a lot for retaliation attacks and therefore i really think it's just massively good to use this the culture traits themselves i went for runesmiths because we are using a lot of unit enchantments this makes them cheaper this makes them more accessible and most importantly this gives us some much needed materium affinity because actually we're not rocking a single materium tone on this build yeah that's just like it is. We are Chaos Dwarves here, or Chaos whatever set you want to play. So the Gifted Casters trait is the other thing that I picked. Two reasons for that. For one, I want the Astral Affinity because it really helps you a lot. And the other thing is Combat Casting is really powerful in this build. You could alternatively pick another um, Astral trait. Actually, all of the three would work quite decently with this build. But I personally love Gifted Casters a lot for making spells cheaper. But any, any of these three would work, but I'd highly recommend you to stick with the Astral Affinity because the Empire upgrades you get out of this tree here are just so useful for you because they speed up your research massively. Now, we are going to talk about the tomes in a minute. So yeah, this rounds up the package that we got and you're really well off with this because we're going to go for a enhancer and morale booster and mor morale destroyer build here. This consists out of the following books. I'm going to start out with pyromancy here. Several reasons for that. Pyromancy offers so many things the industrious culture needs desperately right from the get-go. You gain access to searing blades, which makes your lackluster shield you units finally hit somewhat okay. Fiery Arrows gives your pretty um, interesting <laughs> tier 1 archers at least the chance to inflict burning, also amps up their damage a little bit, but uh, in all honesty it's just an icing on the cake. We are more after the damage spells. Ignite and Immolate are really useful things to help your early game damage, and they're actually useful in all stages of the game. And Magma Spirit and Pyromancer are really the bread and butter things in this book because you gain access to powerful ranged attackers. Pyromancy, uh, pyromancers are stupidly powerful long-range artillery mages. This is their major sales point, by the way. They can fling these extremely volatile bombs six grids wide. This is really cool because if you have three or four of these guys stacked together, they can annihilate entire troop stacks early on. And the Magma Spirit has a huge payoff if you keep him alive turns into a big magma spirit later on and you can summon them wherever you want to added on that you have the ritual pyre nice mana income booster if you happen to have a lot of forests around you so the second tome i went for the tome of warding here again i did this because of two reasons for one i wanted the astral affinity again because i find this highly synergistic with this entire strategy and the defensive elements in here are all very very harmonious with the industrious culture staves of warding gives you bolstered resistance that's your what your racial trait will interact with and all the other things here magical wards you can use some magic resistance mark of invulnerability is a really cool nope spell if somebody dies or happens to die soon static shield goes really super good because you have a taunt unit so you can first taunt and then force the enemy to disable himself it's pretty good stuff and the phantasm warrior again summonable units i like them because they give you flexibility when you suddenly need some backup 
you have it available even if your cities are far away. You can of course go if you want to for other tomes. Evocation would be a pretty cool option too. I personally opted not into it because it just offers more of the same that pyromancy would offer and warding just broadens your options more. So in the tier 2 realm, we are going to go straight away into the Tome of Revelry as the first thing we can grab, mainly because of the Scald. I'll be honest with you, the, the cultural supporter of the Industrious Faction is pretty bad. The Steel Shaper doesn't offer too much support. They can provide some cool little tricks, I'm gonna talk about that later, but the Scald is just the superior supporter. He offers regeneration and several other buffs, he powers up your units, and he even can disable the enemy with his basic attacks, and all the support stuff is AoE, one hex wide, powerful stuff. But most importantly, we start to crank up our morale build here. Revelous Heart gives us more morale from all sources. Blood Fury weapon starts to give us extra morale when we start to kill stuff. Also bolsters up our damage a little bit. These little things, they add up over the course of the time. And Revels of Blood is massive if you happen to use it in a siege. This makes it impossible for the enemy to hide in, inside his fortress because his units will rout eventually if they, they just wait too long. Carnival of Flesh is only... Mm, yeah, well, I personally don't like it too much, but I guess it has uses if you have a lot of farmland around you. So the other tier 2 tome that we're opting into is Doom Herald because you know Doom Herald is just so much fun when you're already running a high morale on your own units why not start destroying the enemy's morale even further because you know you have cruel weaponry giving you extra damage when their morale is low or worse you have a lot of tools like cause despair to lower the morale prelude of doom as a nice army spell to demoralize the enemy even further and joy siphoners is a steel morale thing and this is why it's synergistic with our build because our units not only lower the enemy's morale while whacking them they also increase their own morale because stealing you know therefore this is a really massive synergy and the banshee is another nice battle mage that fits into your roster really decently the doom depth trench is also really nice to have it has some city stability cost but you know you can't afford that most importantly you gain some mana and knowledge and if you happen to be, be uh, to be evil it's even more powerful so the tier 3 tomes, we are going to opt into Devastation first, one hell of an underrated uh, Chaos tome. Major sales point, Flame Burst weapons. You gain critted chance for all your melee guys and also your skirmishers, so you have even some semi-ranged uh, critted chance. And most importantly, the enemies will explode when they get whacked by your melee units. And this is really cool. This is where you're, where you're going full circle and you're your tanky guys can be really dangerous. Unleash the Warhounds is a really powerful siege project offering six free units that you can just toss at the enemy if you happen to need to break down a city. Focus of Devastation gives your many many battle mages and supporters the ability to destroy enemy walls really handy to have at least one demolisher in your ranks when you're going against sieges, seriously. And even Devastator Spheres is not bad, because you can just summon some bombs, roll them into the enemy when you're sieging them. Really powerful, because your whole game plan is a lot about going war into war, you know? And the war breed never hurts to have a, another shock unit that happens to be AoE and summonable, uh, sorry, um, trainable in your cities. Never a bad thing. But the least important thing about this book. The other thing we're going into is the Tome of Subjugation. The only order tome that we're opting into, but you know, it specializes into lowering enemy morale, and that's why we want to have it. Intimidating Aura is giving all your melee units the skill that the Nightmare mounts would offer. That's why I personally wouldn't uh, recommend Nightmares too much, even if I played them in this video. To give them a fair chance that was the case and after that you know if you happen to conquer a lot baron's palace is really awesome final ultimatum <laughs> allows you to recruit enemy units you know this is really amazing when they start fleeing you can just pick what you want to have otherwise they'll destroy them it's a really powerful spell especially in this build it goes amazingly good and subjugating raid well 
The most important sales point of this siege project is that you again can shave down the enemy's morale, and most importantly, the Tyrant Knight. An amazing unit to have, and they are just really, really cool. Um, like a really cool addition because they will inherit your cultural mount. That's why we picked them up, so we have a lot of uh, mounting action here. So that was the tier 3 roster. In the tier 4, we go for Chaos Channeling first, because this plays so long, uh, so nicely along with all the stuff we picked first. Scion of Flame makes us finally immune against burning, so we can finally walk over our own burning ground. And Vengeful Flames, you know, revenge on getting hit just plays so nicely into our cultural roster and um, Fury Wake makes everything burn so there's gonna be a lot of fire around when you play these guys. Demonic Focus gives you another nice unit enchantment for your backline making them more powerful and healing them so you never will have to waste a thought about healing them most of the time that is and Gremlin Ambushers is sick you know, I underestimated in the first glance, but it is a city spell that you can just smack on any city and it gives you free units every turn. And everything that gives you free units is massive. Anything that gives you free units per turn is insane. This is a really, really powerful thing, offensively and defensively. And Fend the Inferno is just another huge nuke that you can use with Scion of Flame, Flame even more because, you know, more burning stuff. And, uh, uh, I'm sorry, no, it just sets the enemy on fire, I, I misread that. And the Golden Horde is just producing another troop stack that you can just plot down if you happen to need backup. So, the build basically ends here, I'll, I'll leave it to you where you go after that. Your affinities won't really allow you to go for anything else than the other Chaos Tome, but in all honesty, the build is complete here. The Tome of the Demon Gate isn't optimal for this, if you happen to gain some other affinities to pick up something else, you would be quite well off, but in all honesty, I felt like the whole engine of, of destruction that we'd be going for was already complete here. So in my usual runs, I went just for more Chaos Tomes, but I felt like if I'd be able to get my hands on the Tome of the Crucible or something like the Tome of the Golden Realm, that would be really massive, but you need to get yourself extra affinity via heroes or other means. That is really important, otherwise you won't have that. But Crucible and Golden Realm are both really nice add-ons into your late game plan, just to mention these. Okay, so enough talk about the tomes. Let's talk about your unit roster. So in the early game, your unit roster will be mostly Anvil Guards, one or two Arbalests in between because their overdraw crossbow skill is just useful and a lot of pyromancers because they can just annihilate lots of troop stacks by just uh, slapping the flame strike on top of your enemies this is why you win against uh, swarmers because you can't just you know if the enemy dares to come with lots of vulnerable units this is just amazing. And after that, when you hit the tier 2 territory, Hobbitiers are really a nice supplement to the Anvil Gods. And, you know, the Steel Shapers, you can mostly forego them, because we're going to go for the Skulls. If you want to play with them, I highly recommend you to play two of them at once, because this way you can have one slapping down Grand Defense, giving the bolster defense thing and the bolster resistance because we're playing states of warding and then the other guy can immediately go for strength for strength from steel and immediately heal him so with two steel shapers you have this kind of emergency heal because you can slap a lot of uh, bolts of resistance on one unit and then heal them up all of a sudden but if you have only one of these they are so disappointing so try to pick up two of these or as soon as you have access to the skulls Skulls are just better supporters than the Steel Shapers. I mean, they are more costly too. Keep that in mind. So, once that's all done, you try to rush as fast as possible to get access to your Bastions, because these guys are just massive. And then your game plan with these units is quite simple. You use your Anvil Guards to be your front line as long as you need them to be. The Bastions should replace them as the frontliners, and once you have access to the Bastions, the Anvil Gods will fill their use to protect your backline. Because whenever anything drops into your backline, the Anvil Gods can A, cut off the pathing by just standing there, and B, taunt them away from your backliners. 
and your harbadiers are basically always somewhere in between. You want them to get hit, you want them to be attacked a lot, and in all honesty, they are your, together with the anvil guards, the units you shouldn't pay too much attention if they die, because they are just meant to do that. They are effective hand grenades, but it's hard to keep them alive, especially with this build. And once you hit the late game territory, you should really try to go for as many um, of these really strong troop stacks that you uh, can get and rely as much as you can on those uh, summons that you get yourselves your hand on. You have very, very powerful units and it's important that you protect them, especially the higher tier ones, but with gremlin ambushers and all the other um, low tier units that you can print out, you have a lot of access to protect the stuff that you want, namely your backline. Your battle mages are vital for your success. The moment you lose your battle mages is usually the moment where you will run dry because uh, the pyromancers are really powerful on their own. And when you manage to get some uh, bigger magma spirits in, stuff gets really, really cool. So in a grand total, you want to have your low tier units as throwaway units and your high tier units you want to keep them alive and as soon as you go into the subjugation tree you can go for tyrant knights or if you happen to go in the later stages then into the the other tier for tome of demon gate you gain access to crank out super powerful fiends by just producing them on your own fight for power demonic summoning these things give you the ability to create some really high tier units that you can protect with your low tier uh, rabble and victory wise i personally feel like you're really really well suited to just topple everybody over and attack them because you grow in power relatively fast but you can also go for a magic victory if you see fit to that if you want to go for a magic victory though i really suggest you to keep an eye out on your research income because i personally felt like this was the weakest side of my build here you have not too many native sources for income so you should really try to focus the um, special improvements that you got like the doom depth trench don't, don't forget about them they are really really important that you keep your research income high because otherwise the ai could outrace you but yeah i don't think this build is too good in an exp and expansionistic play style i want to mention here another thing which is uh, really really important use at the beginning of the game your prospectors a lot you need the prospecting in the early phase of the game to not fall behind so keep an eye out for cliffs and mountains and all these uh, provinces and dig out these things early on to give yourself a nice advantage you can also use if ever things go uh, really bad the right of the last stand to print out some units because basically i mentioned that i that you have a relatively early a strong early game but this is not by far not your strongest point your strongest point goes when you have all those uh, highly buffed morale destroying guys going that just survive a lot getting boosted up by your skulls from the back line and surviving and surviving and then the enemy slowly starts to crumble because you demolish their morale. You can also use the Banshees, of course, I didn't uh, mention them here. You have a lot of tools to work with. So, as an ending point, weaknesses here, if the enemy is not susceptible against burn or morale or both, you are really, really in a hard spot. Because these are your two major um, secret weapons, and uh, if these things ever happen, I highly recommend you to go for a playstyle which focuses more into boosting your own morale instead of trying to destroy the enemy's morale. You can, in this case, for example, exchange the Tome of Subjugation with the Tome of Sanctuary, which is offering you a lot more defensive options and even more morale boosters for your own people, topping off with uh, a, the Keeper's Mark, which is a really, really nice defensive spell as well. So keep an eye out if you happen to fight against a lot of undead or a lot of golemancers this might become a problem for your strategy and this is personally where i feel like this build falls weak against but uh yeah 
usually I end up being pretty successful with this one, and I hope you will enjoy it on your own end as well. Feel free to leave me your comments, your thoughts, and whatever you felt like adding into this video. Leave me a thumbs up, consider subscribing, and of course, I'd be really delighted if you'd check out the playlist down there, leading to all manner of other Age of Wonders video info videos that I made. A big thanks at the end of this video to the supporters of this channel. I deeply appreciate what you guys do. And if you want to find out more, there's Patreon, PayPal, and buy me a coffee as ways and means to support this channel. And I'd be delighted if you'd check them out. If not, well, thanks for hanging out still here. You're one of the very few people that actually do this. And I deeply appreciate. See you guys next time and have a wonderful day.